um, started in, in the civil service um, and then into local government and then uh, where, where she was director of strategy and communication at um, a county council and um, is now director of the, the Centre for Public Scrutiny. So what we're going to do is in a minute, I'm going to hand over uh, to Jackie and she's going to speak. Jackie will share her screen with us so that we can see her slides. What we've done, because we've got so many people on the call today, we've muted everyone because otherwise it, it becomes quite distracting for everyone with the kind of little noises that we all have in, in the background. So everyone is on mute. And um, please do use the chat function, which is at the bottom of your screen. And I can see there's already two, two, um, two items in the chat function, but please use the chat function to um, either raise your hand or you know, ask any questions. And at the end of Jackie's talk, I'll go through and um, and read out the questions for her. That that's I, I know it's quite uh, highly scripted, but that's the best way of doing it in our experience when you've got so many people on the call. So please do use uh, the chat function. We are uh, recording uh, today's lecture and the recording will be available to, um, to everyone that attends um, afterwards, as will the slides. Um, but please, please don't worry, if you put a question forward, the recording doesn't see who's, um, who's raising those questions. So there is no kind of inadvertent um, kind of breach of confidentiality or any of that kind of stuff. So, so that's, that's okay. So. Uh, yeah, so if that's okay with everyone, uh, I'd like to hand over to Jackie. Thanks, Judith. Um, just checking if everyone can see my screen okay, and yep. uh, we'll get into it. That's brilliant. Oh, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm really, really pleased and delighted to be able to speak today. What, what Judith didn't say in the introduction is all, I'm also a very proud trustee of the Advocacy Project. So my passion for kindness, scrutiny, advocacy, involvement um, brings those two worlds together, which, which is, is really, really kind of fitting. I think, Sorry, I'll just... It's all right, we'll... we'll um, it's all right, it's muted. Yeah. Yeah. So as Judith said, um, we had this session planned for quite a while, but it really does feel really very timely to take a step back and reflect on the challenges, but also the opportunities of getting voices heard during COVID. And Judith and I were reflecting that it was about a year ago that I spoke at a similar event um, in a fantastic room at St. Joseph's Hospice in Hackney, where yeah, we were talking about really similar issues, an unbelievable change of time and circumstance. But the things we were worrying about in relation to that event was whether we'd have enough chairs in the room, you know, whether we would be able to kind of access the technology in a way that would be accessible to people. And I think as we hopefully get through this conversation, one of the things we can reflect on is how this pandemic has led to an accessible, a change in accessibility, which means that the 30 or 40 people that we had in the room, we now have probably three times that number listening in today. So, you know, there are some really positives. I'm not sure whether it's as positive that I'm sitting in my kitchen by myself, we're in about cats and teenagers invading, so, but, but we can manage that. So there's three things I would like to um, explore today. The first is around the current situation and how that's impacting on the environment where we're all trying to get voices heard and consider whether there are, you know, why it's harder, but also the opportunities are there. And then try and take a really practical forward look about, you know, what that might mean for us, how that might um, change how we go about trying to get voices heard, or actually we need to kind of carry on because people may be, as we've demonstrated today, a bit more accessible and a bit more able to listen. 
And as Judith said, put questions in the chat box and if there's any other documents I refer to, I'll either tweet them out or we can circulate them later. But also feel free to make contact if, if there's anything that we don't get a chance to pick up today. So really briefly, um, just a little bit about my organisation. Um, we are a really small charity. We have a core staff of about seven or eight people, work nationally, and we've been going for about 18 years now. Lots and lots of work with local government, which is why we were originally set up. But in the last kind of five or so years, much more around health, housing, working both nationally with um, the government and locally and also working with private sector organisations, those who care about being transparent, demonstrating how they're delivering mostly public services. And some of the work that we've done over the last few years, I think demonstrates our passion and belief about involving people. So we did the governance review at Kensington and Chelsea Council following the Grenfell tragedy. We this week have had a report that we've published for the Royal College of Nursing, very complicated membership organisation, around 450,000 members, the biggest nursing union and membership organisation in the world, working with the Royal um, Diocese of London around how do they get people who've been um, involved in safeguarding um, a voice heard there. And again, you can imagine some of the cultural and institutional barriers there. But our passion and belief is that we have to connect these voices with governance and decision making. So lots and lots of other organisations do brilliant work around making sure people's voices get heard, making the heart to hear, that we hear their voices and we work closely with them. But what we believe is that unless you can evidence that that, that is impacting on decision making, then really the, the impact is going to be um, minimized in some way so th so that's about you know our organization and how we go about it and way, the way we see governance is about culture about the way things work not just from a compliance point of view but then you know we do look at structures and we do look at processes as part of that so the very formal mechanisms like boards and scrutiny and other things as well as the informal ones so that's the kind of introduction for us um, Moving on to the kind of considering where we are, um, hopefully you can see this slide and the word trust I think is always central to when we're considering what a good governance environment and a good governance culture looks like. And my gosh, you could really, you know, I think if you Google trust and COVID, um, over the last three months, it would be two dynamics which have been seen as intrinsically, you know, locked together. And we know, and I'm sure we've all experienced it both personally and professionally, being on this roller coaster of experience around how we feel about decision making and how it's kind of been taken during during the process. So, you know, if we look to the um, image on the top left the passion and enthusiasm and kind of empathy that we've had for NHS staff and key workers on the right around the way that communities responded and uh, very much uh, before there was an infrastructure in place. I'm sure we've all experienced where that kind of rose from the ground upwards and then was kind of supported by charities and, and other organizations but you know really really positive kind of sense of what's going on there we then had a shift in how we consumed information so the image which is probably a bit tricky to see on yours around um, how we've changed our the way that we take in information so when we think about how we trust the shift in how we consume news and data and information, particularly in that lockdown, first lockdown phase. So this slide shows you an increase in social media use by age group, with the older age group on the right. So a minimum of 32% increase um, in the older age group and a 58% increase in the younger age group. So a real dramatic shift in, you know, away from uh, TV newspapers, how we may have consumed things in the past. The slide on the bottom left, we could probably have a whole three hour conversation around um, our views on the government and the way that decisions have been made. But again, there are so many dynamics to break down here. You know, 
how we view decision making in relation to lockdown, PPE, black, Asian, ethnic minority groups, you know, a whole kind of plethora of issues there, how the science has been viewed, other countries and how they report their data, the media being trusted and economy. So, you know, a whole kind of raft of things. And the reason I put all of this up, because in all of this, you won't see the G word being mentioned. You know, we're never talking about governance in, in this context. But what we've been talking about in all of this is trust in decision making, whether we feel decisions are being made on the right ev evidence in a transparent way with clear accountability, whether the right people have been involved from scientists to communities to people on the front line delivering care and care, delivering support in care homes. So it's, you know, that, that's been the kind of foundation that we've been looking at. And I think that's a really um, important way that we need to view, because I think as we get further away and hopefully don't have to revisit the kind of crux of that crisis response, I think it will be less easy to hold on to all those emotions that we were feeling at this time. I'm sorry that we've got two pictures of Boris Johnson in our, in our slide deck here, but I thought this was a really excellent uh, way of kind of demonstrating what good governance, what governance has looked like during this period. And um, one of my colleagues who, uh, who works with the Good Governance Institute, Mark Butler, uh, categorized it where he said in an article that governance is not just a peacetime activity, which I thought was the best quote. You know, we can't only talk about governance when things are calm and we have time to consider and we get the papers out seven days before and we, you know, that isn't just what governance is about, although that is what good governance, you know, could and should look like. But we need to be really clear what good governance looks like when our system and our processes are compromised and tested during the most challenging of times. And our argument is that good governance is even more vital during these times than actually they are during the kind of peacetime as Mark described it. Because when you are under pressure to act, and when you need to act decisively and do the right thing, that's where we need some of our systems and processes. And one of the concerns that I had during the first phase of the COVID response was that good governance seemed to be talking about virtual meetings. Now I know that was one of the big challenges that we had and actually it was very stark to think about how much of our governance rests on people being around a rectangle table or a circle, you know, a round table in a room somewhere and face to face. So I think one of the benefits will come from the fact that you don't actually have to always be in the room and think about the impact that would have on diversity and accessibility of who could take up these roles. But again, there'll be a separate talk. But the principles around transparency and accountability really did need to be tested here. And that needed to be tested in the full way that decisions are made, not just when we get to that bit where they have to be in public or they have to be reported in public. So some of the good habits around governance, around the principles of listening, using insight, culture and ways of working, looking at complaints, looking at the evidence and information. And what I'll go in a minute, I'll talk about some of the routes that we have to get voices heard in health and social care but I think that principle of maintaining good governance is one that we do really need to hold on to and I think particularly again as we get into this phase which is a bit slightly calmer for some parts of our sector and looking at what that shift in governance means because I think what we've seen and it's probably difficult to put a percentage on it is that some organisations saw this as a, as a way to move away from governance. And I'm not just talking about that first kind of couple of weeks where I think it was, you know, the priority was absolutely on protecting staff and maintaining critical services and maybe not the time to have a, a governance type discussion. But I think as time has gone on, and I know probably from local government where we've got more of an overview of the sector, 
the organisations that have rushed to put back scrutiny and those that haven't, I think there's there's a kind of consistency maybe in how they've approached their governance pre-COVID. But I think there is a reality that we've, you know, we are operating in. And there were so many, and looking at the images for that this slide, there were so many tragic images that, that we could have included here. And I don't, hopefully you can see the one on the right, which is, um, I've got the image of um, presumably the lady's husband that, that she's visiting there. But you know, the reality is that we have been in a lockdown situation where our first priority has been protecting lives. And you know, words like unprecedented, and you know, we know that, that it has been a really, really challenging and a very, very difficult time. But I think what these images have shown us is how our frontline staff and organisations in the health and care sector have, have um, and I'm sure you know, a lot of you on this call with the jobs that you have, have found creative and alternative and brilliant ways to keep people connected and to keep their voices being heard during the crisis in as difficult a circumstances as, as they have been. And I think that level of resilience and that commitment to making sure that, you know, we keep hearing people's voices and vice versa, people know that we care about them is, is crucial. It really is crucial. But I think what we do need to recognise is the situation where we were previously is probably not coming back for a while. So we do need to adapt to how we work, but also see some of the opportunities that that exist within that. I love that picture on the left, and I have to get that as my screensaver to uh, So you'll know a lot of this already, but might just be helpful to kind of uh, include it here. So how has it made, you know, how has it made COVID made it harder to get voices heard? So decision making has not been business as usual. So from a health perspective, you know, a very centralized model of decision making went even more centralized, very command and control, central management of resources, decision making, shifting, you know, so very, very kind of different approach to how decisions were made there. From a council perspective, the first phase was emergency response. So a shift to executive decision making, whether that was the chief exec, um, or uh, cabinet of some form or leader. We then had the coronavirus bill, which allowed the shift to virtual meetings, so decision-making started to open up, but still that real crisis situation there. And I know from my experience um, as a trustee and a board member and a chief exec, you know, a very different way of doing business. So that first crisis phase of as I say, shift to how we're delivering, protect staff, protect critical services, reviewing budgets, reviewing how we work. So, you know, very, very chain, different chain, different way of operating. The practical changes, as we saw from the last slide, no face to face, we've had staff furloughed, increased workloads in lots of cases, and also people dealing with their own concerns about their own health, their own safety, their family, et cetera. So, you know, a very, very heightened situation. I don't think we can underestimate the impact of, the, of funding. And I think, again, if you look at the differences that we've seen across the sectors, so, you know, um, not my words, but you could say the NHS was given a blank check to start with. I know that's not the reality early on, but that did kind of shift how, uh, the NHS was given permission to respond and the resources it could allocate. Local government is obviously, you know, was sort of given a blank check and then it was withdrawn. And now, you know, there's lots of to and froing there. Similar in housing, charity sector, you know, an absolute pittance um, directed after the work of the NCBO there. So a real different kind of environment that people are operating in. And the flip side and the response dominating the agenda and the flip side of the digital inclusion that we're all benefiting from today has been a real shift in a digital exclusion. So, you know, we know that uh, people that 
high statistics, particularly in older groups, vulnerable groups, around um, how people are uh, accessing information. We know the statistics around children's access to PCs for homeschooling. So all of this creates a context where it's been very challenging and difficult to get voices heard when it may have been getting to the top of the agenda you know it's been pushed down but lots of valid reasons i think in some cases may be less valid in other organizations cases but we're here to not be too negative and to see a positive and a silver lining in uh, the crisis and the opportunity that it creates for us to get voices heard as judith said the last week could not you know, the, the shift that has happened in how people are um, getting their voices heard in ways that, you know, some of the more traditional um, methods around protesting, around, um, you know, social media campaigns, but the public reaction to health, social care, social care inclusion, equality rights has probably been higher on the agenda than it's ever been before. Now we know the government might not be responding as quickly as we might want them to, but what a great time and opportunity to get voices heard and the chance to get voices heard where people have lived experience. And I could talk about the Marcus Rashford example, but you know, someone who is a celebrity but has a real personal, so if you don't know, if you haven't been on Twitter today, so Marcus Rashford, 22 year old Manchester United footballer, has done a lot of work during lockdown around child poverty um, and has been campaigning for uh, food vouchers to be continued during the school holidays, free school meal vouchers. So someone, but someone who had personal experience of that himself, so you know, the way that um, government and others are being influenced at the moment, the, the sands have shifted. And you know, it is a very, very different uh, situation out there. The second is around commitment to reset and not just recover. So in emergency planning language, we have the crisis response and then we have the recovery response. And in the past that has been, we will go back and put everything back together in the same way that it was before. And I think it felt like um, the conversations we were having about the environment, the conversations that we're now having about equality and inclusion, the way that the community has stepped up, the shift in power that has happened, how public services are being delivered, everything from doctors, online um, conversations, you know, right the way through to the whole redesign of social care. It feels like all of these are on the agenda. And I think all of us have got a responsibility to really push now and really take forward that debate. And then the final one is the revolution about digital working and accessibility. And as I say, really keen that we don't just talk about on, you know, working from home as great as that is most of the time, or, you know, virtual meetings, but the, the opportunities that that can create from an accessibility point of view, the barriers that have existed from engaging with people with lived experience, engaging with people with disabilities, engaging with people with mental health problems who find those kind of, you know, boardroom type situations or the very traditional consultation and engagement situations, very, very challenging for them to get their views across. What a great opportunity it is for us to start to have a different conversation in a very different way. Not forgetting, as the pitch on the bottom right shows, that the good old fashioned protest is still a good way of doing things. The town hall meeting, you know, we don't, we don't want to get rid of face to face completely, but it feels like there is this opportunity as we start to come out of this to have a think about ensuring that the value of people's voices is recognised but also the ways that we hear those voices, we can start to think about that. And I know in the advocacy project, you know, we've really been looking at, well, how does advocacy take place and how can we kind of, 
you know, take advantage of some of the opportunities there, as well as learn the lessons of those people who have felt that, you know, they haven't had their voice heard because we haven't been able to connect with them in the, in the way that they feel matches their needs the most. This looks like a very dull governance slide, so it's, it's the only one, I think, in here. But I just thought it might be helpful. And I think, you know, all of you who are here will, will recognise this. But I think it is helpful when we start to think about the practicalities of, well, how do we move forward in this world? And how do we think about the way that we can influence change and influence the way that decisions are made and all of these boxes kind of connect and lots of interdependencies in in between there but i think when we do think about the way that voices are heard and the way that we can start to apply some of the lessons as we debrief around well, what worked well what didn't work well so in relation to my own care and the influence that I can have on that, you know, what would we like to keep moving forward to ensure that my voice is heard and I feel that my rights are protected, my views are valued and I can see some real benefits in there. So around own care, I'm sure there's going to be a huge amount of work that will be done around families in decision making around health and care through the experience of them being excluded during the last few months and particularly as we look at, home, at care homes and how some of the decisions were made there but also hospitals so the environment within which those decisions are made and again what's worked what doesn't work where's technology added an advantage what can we do that will make that different and better in the future advocacy we've talked about Complaints, I think, will be really interesting. I mean, as we all know on this call, they are the kind of, I always think they're like a secret gold mine of information where, you know, for organisations that are very low on complaints, I'm always very suspicious. And, you know, for those that are high, what a, what a mind of um, information that we have there. But I think it will be interesting as uh, we go through just to see what's happened in relation to complaints during this period. And again, you know, what process do we need to put in there so people feel like they have their voice heard um, during the kind of time constraints of complaints? And it's been interesting. We work with um, Mia's, the housing and um, repairs company, who, um, in their own analysis of complaints, um, they found that uh, the level of goodwill that was around particularly in March, April time and that people were just so grateful that their kind of urgent repair was being met and really kind of thankful. So what they found is they had a kind of goodwill bounce and I'm sure they were doing great work and you know in, in a very difficult circumstances. So I think it will be interesting as we look at what's that telling us about how people either felt like they could get their voices heard and whether organisations are still responding to that. If you move on to the organisation area there, we're back into that well that we talked about at the beginning really, which is from a service level, some of the principles around co-design, you know, the, the, the shift that happened in organisations um, from digital working to the way that commissioning happened, to the way that services were redesigned. I mean, some of us have spent a career trying to encourage that kind of shift, which happened in eight weeks in some organisations. So the barriers about what can't happen and what's impossible to happen have fallen away. So we now know that these organisations can operate flexibly. There is opportunities for how things are commissioned. How do we formalise some of the good service change that we've seen? You know, what's the situation going to be in relation to resource allocation moving forward if we do have the economic challenges that we think we're going to have and how do we ensure voices are heard in that process and also policy making both locally and nationally really is up for grabs when it comes to this new world that we're in and how decisions are going to be made. 
and then the last one is about about system and I know both my organization and the advocacy project and and I know others on the call from health watch and and other uh, local and national organizations this is where we know we can have you know, a significant wide broad lasting impact and that's in relation to place making speaking on behalf of communities of interest so drawing on the knowledge that we have of um, encouraging people with learner disabilities to take on jobs the challenges around um, people getting their voices heard except you know so there's some really uh, key issues I think that we can be looking to influence here when it comes to policy and law making and this was probably a slide that we could have had uh, pre-Brexit when that's all we were concerned about because the sense then was if we are going to devolve powers back to the UK and then ideally back to locally what does that mean I think what the pandemic has done has shown that we're kind of as equally operating in a global um, if you look at the um, Black Lives Matters response, you know, that was a global kind of response as we are to national. So just really thinking about how the decisions are made and how the systems operate in, in each of those areas, I think is, is important when it comes to thinking about how we can affect change. And very often, a bit like making a cup of tea, you don't really think about these things when, you know, like me, you've operated in these systems for way too long. And I think sometimes it can be really helpful, and this feels like a good time, just to take that step back and to be really systematic and quite strategic as well as tactical about how we want to affect change and what's the best way of, of going about that. So a, a couple more slides on, on the practical side of things. And actually this was a slide uh, I had in the, um, the, the talk I did uh, about a year ago uh, with a couple of, of added elements to it, because there is an element here of taking the usual route. We know as much as, and I'm sure there's a bit of um, selective, um, picking out going on as many articles that I read about how the world is going to change and how everyone is up for change there's probably exactly the same number of articles that are either being written or not being written about people who want and are desperate to go back to the way they things were and that's not a negative you know I want to get on a bus and I want to go to a restaurant and the library and the swimming pool so I think we need to kind of know that there will be this uh, pull back towards the usual route. That's the good side of it. The bad side of it is powers and institutions do not let go of their power easily. They really, really don't. And these are good people trying to do good things. Well, you are trying to kick back against an institution that's been there you know very many hundreds of years against democracy and how they perceive that should be acted against kind of you know procurement rules and etc cetera, etc cetera. you know all of this stuff that's a bit like elastic you know we can only pull it so far and it's going to pull back at some point so we need to keep these in mind as well as the kind of more maverick approach that we're we're also going to be thinking about so we know this is about relationships you know the, the governance word will talk about process it will talk about you know deadlines and uh, quarracy and all that kind of good stuff but actually it is about building those relationships and really kind of working out what it is that we want so being clear on the ask and then we get into where the previous slide was. So understanding where the power lies and how those decisions are made. So, you know, if we think of a health example or if we think of um, a social care example or a particular uh, setting, you know, very often the old analogy is, not it? you know, the PA is often the most powerful person in the organisation because that's where the gatekeeper sits. You'll know organisations actually where the commissioner 
is the person that when they make recommendations to the politicians all of those recommendations are you know so it is just about building those relationships and building that trust which is we want voices to be heard because we firmly believe that we will deliver better outcomes as a result so we're not just here to cause trouble we're not well you know we might be perceived as that, but it's not just negative. This is about trying to collaborate and find ways to work together to deliver better outcomes. Knowing the structures and the rules, I'm sure nearly all of you on here kind of, you know, know what they are, know where they can be bent, but it is really important, not, not the legal and procurement ones, obviously, but you know, know where some of the others can be and actually find your way to get in there, to be telling your story in a human way, but with that strong evidence base. And I think that's the element, you know, what's the narrative, what's the story, how can we present here? And again, back to the Marcus Rashford example, telling it in a human way, but having those statistics that, that can talk about 1.3 million children now won't be hungry, or, you know, what the impact will be creating the internal supporters and being noisy and determined when you have to be. And I think that I probably should have said when you have to be, because I think there is something here where, you know, it, you can also get things done in a quiet way. And that doesn't mean you're not going to run a public campaign or you're not going to try and find ways. But I think some of the trust and relationships is built on by showing that that's the way that you can operate or when you need to escalate as well. And the final slide is just around where the new opportunities will exist. And I think these are probably the tip of the iceberg around how things will, you know, people will want to think differently, but what will the governance and the engagement and the involvement routes be? as we move forward. So probably one that I'm sure you will have heard of around NHS Reset, which is a campaign that the NHS Confederation is running with lots of um, supporter organisations around well, what should the future of health and care be. We know that you know nearly every local organisation is going to have some sort of review of their COVID response whether that's a board-led review, an operational-led review, scrutiny, you know, it will happen. And I think that's where organisations like the Advocacy Project and like all of your organisations, there will be calls for evidence for this, or there will be opportunities where you can be pushing yourself forward to make sure that the voice, voices are heard and heard in a way which is conducive and kind of, you know, welcoming. Uh, member organisations, a lot of organisations looking at, well, how did, how did we act during that period, whether that's to our members or to our staff. Consultation on service change, we've talked about equality and BAME reviews, again, coming out. And then a really big national policy debate, which I talked about earlier, and one example of that is citizen shift. But there'll be lots and lots of lots of others there which are well actually how do we take this opportunity to shift the way that people are seen move away from people being seen as customers or consumers to being seen as citizens in the case of this campaign so lots of things out there i think some of the same rules will apply around human face evidence etc but it does feel like if we are ready and equipped, there could be a really excellent opportunity as we start to get through this next phase to ensure that people's voices are heard. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Jackie. Can you take it off screen share? Yeah, yeah thank you. That was brilliant. I always love hearing you speak because it just makes me so you, you you just reignite that that fire within and i'm just ready to go so so thank you for that um please everyone post questions via the chat um and while people are thinking about that and doing that there's one from john williams and also one from me so one from john um should individual also include agency so john does that agency mean as in personal agency yeah 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 absolutely 
absolutely. I think that's a kind of... Um, so a kind empowerment, of, agency, uh, rather than being done to... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think, John, it's a really, really good point because I think that shift, you know, we'd hope had already started to happen. I think one of the risks as we saw, and I know that um, Jonathan Ellis spoke a couple of weeks ago around some of the decisions that have been made in hospices around do not resuscitate, et cetera. I think, again, that will be a key part of the debate. Um, but really, we are talking about all aspects of empowerment and ensuring people's voices are heard. So I'm reading, I should take this off, shouldn't I, so I don't get distracted by the questions that are coming up there. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I do have a question, but I will keep that and see, see if there's time for that at the end. So one from Jonathan Slater here. Uh, what are your suggestions on how local authorities engage seldom heard communities when planning for services as we come out of lockdown? I think there's some aspects of this, Jonathan, which, you know, we would have, and I'm sure you would have been advocating for prior to lockdown, which is, you know, firstly, working with organisations and agencies where there are already relationships that exist and finding creative ways to ensure that seldom voices are heard. I mean, we know, and I think, you know, it's... Um, it's exaggerating to make the point, but running the town hall meeting at seven o'clock on a wet Wednesday mm. and expecting people to turn up when you wouldn't anyway, but also, you know, a certain type of person, a certain level of confidence, the people who usually engage will do that. And there are some examples where people have done it well, but it does feel like there are some really great opportunities to build on what's worked during lockdown so looking at how community responses have worked in particular localities or with particular groups looking at whether digital engagement has enabled more accessibility and more inclusion for seldom hear groups as opposed to you know them becoming more excluded so i think the level of kind of creativity and determination that we all try and show every day in making sure we're here that's where we need to get people there and i think when the when we're looking at kind of maybe less resources being allocated there's even more argument for that mm -hmm. so next we've got a really great question from cynthia white uh how do we approach auditing and challenging where easements in health and social care have moved from temporary to de facto permanent and i would add to that sometimes easements we've observed um, that they have to be enacted but but sometimes they're informally rather than formally acted yeah, and I think we've also seen examples where people have kind of signed the check and may not have cashed it yet around easements. Um, I, I think that's that's probably one. I mean, it's not easier because, as Judith said, sometimes a practice does not match what's written down on paper. However, there you know there is a transparent democratic decision making process which is around easements that we should be able to challenge and able to you know approach the organization to see what's happened there with evidence about what's happening so i think there is a process there and it's not unreasonable to approach the council or approach commissioners to say you know what is the process going to be how is that there and if we need to get into freedom of information if we have to although you wouldn't really want to you'd want to be able to get there through a different route the other thing I was going to say around opportunities, and it doesn't apply to everyone, but people are slightly more accessible in these circumstances as well. I know people are still overwhelmed with emails and others, but these people who have been kind of, you know, locked in proper meetings or traveling all over the place. So sometimes, you know, you can establish that connection a bit easier, but it should be auditable and it should be transparent. I think the challenge will be where the practice is different than what uh, the, the legal position says. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and challenging decisions where 
you think they're not in line with what it should be? Absolutely. That was a great question from Cynthia, who is uh, chair of City and Hackney Older People's mm -hmm. Reference Group. So thank you, Cynthia. Uh, a great one from Tanya now, Tanya Maskell. How can we navigate the difficulties of advocating for both individuals and communities as a whole? Because sometimes, possibly often, you find interests being at odds with each other. Mm. So how do you value, that's not the right word, but, but how do you weigh certain voices against others? Yeah, that's a really, really good one. A really good one. And I think, you know, we wouldn't all um, be human beings if if we didn't have that difference in views and that difference in kind of needs and requirements. I, th I think really it is being clear on what the ask is and how we kind of articulate that in a way where um, we are able to communicate the complexity of some of these situations. And I think, you know, thinking about how uh, the Black Lives Matters debate has, um, not debate, but, you know, the kind of issue has arisen, the complexity and the kind of variation and the, you know, even within the movement, the different angles to the argument there, mm -hmm. I think it's shown that Policymakers and the public and other interested parties are really quite sophisticated in how they can take on these um, different challenges and the, the kind of difficulties that organisations have in working out where to direct their resources and where to um, and how to respond. And I, you know, when we think about the issues that we're dealing with, they are in some cases unprecedented as we've talked about it in other cases they are kind of they've been around for a very long time mm. but being clear what the ask is and what the change is and then being able to articulate it in a way where um, those people who we've been working with can see their argument in there or can see their situation in there somewhere but the other thing is you can't please everyone and in terms of achieving good, sometimes you have to go with the kind of common themes and the common issues in order to make that change happen before we can get onto some of the kind of, you know, uh, variables that might impact on less people. So that was probably an unbelievably long-winded answer. <laughs> that answer. No, that's fine, and I, I absolutely get that. So interesting one from Will. Mm. Uh, Non-statutory advoca community advocacy appears to be underfunded. It's almost, you know, if you look at the tenders coming out now on the portals, very few of them have uh, non-statutory advocacy, community advocacy, uh, meaning that growing demand might not be met. And could this be bolstered as a response to lockdown so that as, as we come out of lockdown, people get their voices heard uh, more effectively? Yeah, I, I mean, the you know, intersection of voices and commissioning, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that it's one that you'll have a view on, Judith. I mean, I think the answer is yes. I I think the challenge will be whether organisations um, are able to kind of join up during this period and be able to see. I mean, you would hope that that is the sort of change that we would want to see coming from this. I think what we don't want to happen is, you know, we want every organisation to value non-statutory advocacy and be investing in it as we would hope they should be doing. But I think you're right, what is the opportunity that the Advocacy Project and other organisations can be pushing, which is for this phase as we come out of lockdown, what does advocacy look like during this phase, I think is a really excellent idea. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And working with community groups, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, building the capacity of community groups, people and, and, and groups to advocate for themselves and others. So there's maybe something that we need to do as an advocacy sector and as a broader society to, to build the capacity of community people and communities to advocate for themselves mm -hmm. and others. Uh, 
great question here from my good buddy Joe from the Kensington and Chelsea Social Council. Um, our local authority listened to the community and to the Centre for Public Scrutiny um, address elements of good governance, adopting the 12 principles and going on to create a charter for public participation, but they stopped short of embracing some of the letting go of power to the community, characterising it as an ask for devolution. A review of the new systems is to be done by the council without resident input. So how can communities ask for genuine co-production without spooking the horses? Power being released glacially is destroying a nascent sense of local democracy, which was beginning to seed. Yeah. Wow, what a beautifully articulated Absolutely. question. Um, yeah, I think this is a really good example of the, as we say, the kind of glacial, glacially pace that change can happen. Um, and actually thinking about reflecting on um, the context that Kensington and Chelsea were operating in immediately post Grenfell to three years on, where maybe the attention and the spotlight is not as sharp um, or bright even um, around how they're reviewing their system and their processes. I think it might be worth us having a conversation off, offline about this just to kind of, when we, we obviously hold no kind of power over making councils accept our principles, but we might be able to do some prompting. But I think this is a really, you know, a great example of the enthusiasm that can happen immediately after something terrible has happened or when there is a great opportunity but actually that kind of elastic band of the system pulling power back mm. even to the point where you know we're going to do a review without resident input which is just um you know unbelievably not acceptable even if we're not going to let go of power anyway so yeah a kind of a depressing reminder i think of of how we need to kind of keep the pressure up and keep that kind of system going which is using the informal using the formal really trying to you know not letting go and, and being resilient even three years on mm -hmm. yeah great 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 idea and so we can follow up separately on that with um with kcsc uh, and then a uh, couple more here, one from Senaha, one from Asia, and then we're coming close to um, four o'clock, so we can't be too much more. Um, but if people do have questions that don't get answered today, please do email them in. And um, what we can do after this event is, is pull together a Q&A that uh, Jackie, you and I can work on and then send out to everyone. Uh, so from Senaha, um, sorry, my screen's just gone. Uh, so here we go. How do we join up with other organizations and work transparency to, uh, transparently to raise and tackle collective issues whilst maintaining independence? Mm. Yeah, so that's, that's an important point that we, um, as a sector, as the charity sector, as the advocacy sector, maybe as CFPS, mm -hmm. we're kind of raising issues and we're challenging, but at the same time, there is a sense of, um, there's a commissioning relationship there as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is that, that kind of, I'm sure there's a framework in there, which is, you know, being, being really clear what the ask is and really clear where there is benefit and extra power and impact that can be gained from joining together. And those policy and campaigning issues are the area where you do join together. And you don't, you know, I think, you know, um, a kind of sensible organization and set of individuals can kind of do that we are going to be competing against each other for work but actually this is something that collectively we know would make a massive difference to 
all of the people that we're all working with and who, at whatever time we're working with and be able to have that separate debate but also trying to find ways to make sure that your voice is heard and that you're kind of you know if it, if it is about profile but I think there are ways that can be doing that I think what we tend to do I know my organization you know we'll try and have kind of five debates going on at the same time or five asks at the same time and that's where it can get a bit confusing and you know you can lose some of that trust whereas working out what the main issues are and then really focus on efforts and resource is a great way of, of getting that off but also partnering with organizations that may bring something different so again in the same pool but i've got slightly different angles as i said before loads of organizations do really good work around um democratic engagement community engagement empowerment advocacy and we don't want to be in that space even though we're in the same kind of broad area so just finding ways to partner there as well might help get over the conflict side of things mm. and, and i think there's there's a great example recently of how the advocacy sector mm. you know at times compete for, against each other for contracts because that's how we're funded but we've come together under, you know, under COVID and worked together on, you know, resources like the Mythbuster, um, that advocacy is not suspended and, and all those kind of issues. So I think you're right, There's, that, that there is a, a, way, a way of negotiating through that. And uh, just one final one um, here. So, uh, and this was from Asia and also I think Carol. Um, how does the service user keep control of the narrative? Um, and, you know, how do we um, keep being if effective when sometimes we're in the room, sometimes we're not in the room? How, how do we support service users to keep control of their own story, to put it that way, when we, we're, we're not always standing there next to them at the moment? And maybe there's no, you know, um, great answer to that at the moment, but maybe that's one of the things that we need to make sure that comes out of this current current crisis if that's the right word that we find ways of doing this but yeah and, and i think there's something about that kind of very individual perspective around say how decisions are made about you know my own health and my own care mm. through to how do we use um uh, not use but you know take an individual story and use that to amplify um the, the kind of human face of what we're trying to communicate from a governance and a decision making point of view as we get further up the hierarchy and I think that's part of the challenge I think there's a really good point about the individual and how do we kind of get voices so from an advocacy point of view when we're not in the room right the way through to how do we then amplify that and make sure people are you know feel like their kind of rights and dignity and everything else associated with that is protected and respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, we're just about at four o'clock. So I think we need to bring things to a close now. So we will share the recording with everyone. We will share your slides with everyone. If anyone's got any other questions, please do uh, uh, send them in and we will make sure that they, they get answered. Um, and sorry i'm just looking here that there's something else coming no it, it's it's fine so we'll share the slides um any more questions please please do let us know we'll answer them and just um, an amazing thank you jackie it's been absolutely brilliant and we've got all sorts of um you know messages coming in saying what a brilliant uh, brilliant session that this has been thank you so much and yeah absolutely inspiring and i'm really fired up about the opportunity that we've got moving forward so thank you for for reigniting that fire yeah okay thanks everyone bye